Excellent. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, Professor Shik Makarov from uh, bright and early. Uh, it's 6 a.m. for us, her over there uh, present to us on uh, the use of patient reported outcomes. Uh, professor Makarov, Shik Makarov, uh, professor, uh, and she's the associate of graduate studies at the University of Al Alberta in Edmonton. Uh, her uh, research is on a bunch of things, but basically looking at how can we improve the uh, evaluation and use of electronic prompts uh, in, in patients with chronic kidney chronic disease, especially kidney failure, which is right in uh, you know what we want to know. Uh, so take it off. Great. Thank you so much for being here. And as I was saying earlier, I apologize for any technical glitches. They are entirely my own. Um, thank you for the kind invitation. Um, indeed, we are going to do a little bit of old school, so you're going to hear me say things like, next slide. So <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, so um, I am located at the University of Alberta, currently in my basement, but will be there very soon in the, the work um, that I have been doing uh, is there. and respectfully acknowledge that I'm located in Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous people, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda, Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Sautu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. And um, I was born on Treaty 6. My family, um, both sides is from Germany and they were pioneers and settlers uh, in Saskatchewan actually. So almost my entire life I've been on Treaty 6 and continue to have the opportunity to work and live and play and do these types of things with you today and, and I honor them and give them thanks. Next slide please. Yes, so these are the objectives that were um, circulated today, but just by way of recap and waking up. Um, our objectives are, I'm going to talk about threshold concepts of patient reported outcomes as building blocks or person-centered care. Describe how pros or patient reported outcomes are currently used, could be used in dialysis, and then um, talk about some pragmatic strategies about how we might move the field forward, both at individual level and aggregate levels. Next slide, please. For those of you who are visual learners, Here's an outline. So starting with threshold concepts, PROMs or PREMs, um, and person-centered care. What does that mean? We hear it a lot in our uh, everyday worlds now. Um, I'll talk about pro or PROM use in dialysis, again, individual and aggregated levels, share some evidence, research that I primarily have been in, involved with, but also internationally what's happening, and some takeaway strategies. Next slide. Yeah, so many of you who are there right now or online or may watch this later, you don't know who I am. <laughs> I am a new face to you. So just by way of introduction, um, I'm a nurse and uh, my master's was in policy and uh, my research was with people who had disabilities. Um, and I started in research in kidney in my PhD and that was funded uh, by the Kidney Foundation of Canada. And then I had the opportunity to do a four year postdoc and a new investigator, both funded by Crescent. And that's where I met a few of your colleagues, Dylan Berger and Kevin Burns, who's here and was a mentor to me. And I honor you and recognize I'm a part of a very significant community that informed this work. We never do this alone. <laughs> so my work is very much equity seeking and patient oriented. And the goal of my program of research, I've just depicted here with simple bubbles, it's to enhance knowledge about use of quality of life assessment and promote equitable person-centered care in order to improve services for people living at home with chronic and life-limiting illnesses, particularly um, kidney failure. And a major focus of my research is on translating evidence on the outcomes of routine use of um, patient reported outcomes in multidisciplinary care. Put another way, um, I would be very happy if my life's work culminated in clinicians looking at quality of life information reported by patients, looking at them and discussing their responses with them. And also for us as dialysis programs to figure out how we may use that information to inform our policy and, and uh, program planning. 
Next slide. So now I've told you a little bit about me, um, either by unmuting yourself or maybe in the chat. Yeah, I do see a chat function here. Can you just tell me what patient reported tools or questionnaires you routinely ask patients to complete and provide to you? And by that, I do not mean metrics like um, blood pressure or temperature, but um, something that's a self-assessment. And if you don't use any, that's okay too. I don't see in the chat, yeah. but I think there is uh, the Ontario Renal Network. I think Mike Walsh uh, leads, and there is a there is one tool that we are supposed to fill out. I don't know if there is anyone else in the audience who knows more about this. Than yeah. My, yeah, the ESAS uh, Renal, yeah, Jan. Yes, and I'm aware of the Empathy Initiative in Ontario where they use Your Symptoms Matter. Yeah, Caitlin and Jan, thank you. Got it, ESAS Renal. Yeah, probably the most common use in Canada, no doubt about that. Okay, cool. So, and I should have said this at the beginning, feel free to chat, uh, use chat function throughout. I'll just go through my presentation. It'll probably be about, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for discussion, yeah. But also feel free to chat too. Great. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you for that. So I'm just going to start again, as I said earlier, threshold concepts. These are when we uh, need these to understand and move to a deeper learning. And this field has been plagued by the use of acronyms. And one of the things I've learned is that uh, we don't know what they mean. <laughs> or we use them, but we don't understand what the, the underlying assumptions are underneath them. So I thought I'll start there. So you'll see many acronyms used. Pro prom, um, EPRO, meaning the electronic patient reported outcome or measure. PREM is distinct. So that is patient uh, experience or satisfaction with care. And uh, historically, the term PROM was created in part for regulatory purposes uh, res with respect to FDA guidelines for use of health related quality of life in advertising claims actually by pharmaceuticals. This is where this term came from. They essentially, however, are standardized tools for patients to answer questions about their health and quality of life. It includes symptoms, but is not limited to symptoms. So it includes physical, psychological, social well-being, and experiences of healthcare received. In dialysis, we've really focused on symptoms, but I just want to uh, emphasize it's only one of many domains that are a part of patient-reported outcomes, yeah. Um, by definition, um, a PROM must be created with patient involvement and input. They come directly from the patient. They are not a proxy measure. For literally over five decades now, PROMs have been used in research. It's very recent that uh, they're being used in clinical practice and very recent that they're being considered even at an aggregate level for policy and quality and safety. Um, so just to note, they were not designed for the use for which we are using them right now. They have evolved over time like so many things do. And uh, just this last bullet here, then internationally, you know, the Institute of Health Improvement champions organizations where clinicians value and routinely measure and act on what matters to patients. And this is one way of patients expressing what matters to them. Next slide, please. So these instruments are designed to obtain information from patients and families, as it can be a very significant part of this too, about their quality of life, as well as healthcare experiences without interference from uh, clinicians or any other person. So most importantly, they provide direction for clinical assessment, and they are not clinical assessments. They do not replace a clinical assessment or a diagnosis. They do not robustly express a patient's or a family caregiver's experience. They just simply piece a microphone in front of a person to share very briefly about what might be import important to them. So they're an initial step. They're not the only step, and they're certainly not the final step. Perhaps one of the most frequent mistakes I see in the literature or here in conversations uh, is equating patient-reported outcomes with patient outcomes or clinical outcomes. Um, and they're not the same thing. And we just want to be clear about what we mean about them. Personally, I'm actually moving away from the terms PROMs and PREMs. I'm talking about quality of life assessments as a pseudonym because I think it's a more robust expression and it's a self-assessment. Uh, next 
Next slide, please. So person-centered care, what about this? Yeah, so it places patients and families at the forefront of healthcare. Uh, so it moves beyond the medical and clinical and it's a valuing of a patient as a person or a human being um, with a biography is a phrase we often use. So these building blocks here on the slide are meant to depict that a key characteristic of person-centered care is to enable the patient or their families to tell their stories and to share information to people that may influence their care. And just to be really clear that, um, you know, completing a prom and putting it on a file is not the totality of person-centered care. It has a piece of it and it can be a part of it. Um, the imperative for person-centered care requires the full range of healthcare experiences and outcomes and are routinely assessed and integrated at all different levels of healthcare decision-making. And next slide, this is just an example. So uh, a current Kidney Foundation of Canada project that I'm leading, and I thank them for their funding always, is to develop a pathway in Alberta to support person-centered mental health care and dialysis. Um, our assessment working group dug into the literature, um, particularly a very recent synthesis on the, the concept of centeredness, and I reference it here. So we articulated these person-centered care principles. There were three core ones and then multiple themes that were, we've used consistently throughout two years to um, inform development of tailoring of the pathway. And then because we're using Adelphi, we ensured that the languages and the focus of every statement in that Delphi attended to these principles. So I highlight this because patient reported outcomes may be um, uh, le leveraged as building blocks for person-centered care in various contexts, um, not just proms and prems. So uh, next, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, so proms um, can inform person-centered care at all levels of healthcare decision-making, this just gives an overview of the field. So at the micro level or at the individual level, this is the use between a patient who may complete one and share it with their clinician, uh, that's micro. At the meso level, it can be they can be aggregated and then used for things like quality improvement and assurance. Um, and then at the macro level, this is the systems level again, typically used at aggregation. I'm going to share more theories about this, which might be a bit too early in the morning for that, but this is an overview. Next slide. Again, just some examples. So in kidney care, the United States and the UK both specifically have national requirements for pro uh, collection and registry. So in Canada, they're used really widely, but very disparately. Uh, there is not uh, synchronization. Um, there is a database in case anybody wants to know about all of the PROMs and PREMs available. ProQualit is our database. There's over 900 PROMs that have currently been developed and more every day. The black ones on this slide, these are PROM instruments that are used across illness groups. So we might refer to them as generic. The green are um, preference-based or utility. We'll use these in economic analyses. And the blue are disease-specific. And the ESAS renal was identified as one that's been tailored. I have in here purple, the PHQ-9, one that's specific to a, a very tailored uh, element. And the next slide. So how might these be beneficial? Like why, why are we even spending this time talking about them? As I said earlier, yeah, we have over five decades of research that suggests that use of PROMs and PREMs may enhance person-centered care. And the research has identified uh, benefits of enhanced communication, raising awareness of problems that we otherwise would have missed, improving care plans and multidisciplinary collaboration. And this type of information has been identified as a top research priority to kidney patients and their, and their caregivers. And this reference here is, is by Manz et al. in 2014, but it's nine years old. So have we moved the needle at all? Um, so next slide. In, uh, in kidney care, integration into routine practice has been a little elusive. So some of the shortcomings here, um, as we've done research over the year, is that there's, a, there's been a bit of a lack of consultation about which tools do we collect? How do we collect them? Um, how do we integrate them into our daily practices so that they're not an add-on or something that's off, hanging off the side of the desk? 
Um, neither clinicians or uh, patients have really received much training about what this is and why they're being asked to complete it. And clinicians, particularly, huge amounts of data in the dialysis world, they feel ill-prepared to address the, uh, the concerns that are raised, particularly mental health. So uh, one of the most re robust reviews that I've read thus far is by, by Joanne Greenhalgh uh, from the University of Leeds, and that reference is here on this slide. Next, next one. So how are they being used? So in Alberta here, in supportive care, the ESAS renal, also in empathy, when that rolled out here in the province, they used the ESAS renal. In British Columbia, also ESAS renal, but they use the PACIC as well. Uh, in Ontario, as was already mentioned, yeah, your symptoms matter. Um, in empathy trial, the ESAS renal. I also did some little lurking online and found your Ontario renal plan three person-centered goal of the strategic objective, which states expand the use of patient-reported experience and outcomes to drive improvements. So you see immediately into that the meso and macro initiatives that underplay identification of this. In the United States, interestingly, it's mandated by Medicare for reimbursement of dialysis programs. They must complete them and report them. In the UK, they use something called Your Health Survey. It's completed by all national renal units. The intention is that they are publicly reported. Um, I know nothing about um, family caregivers, you, completion of dialysis actually anywhere in the world. There's tiny little research um, projects, but nothing um, nationally or yeah, so that's a gap, it's something we need to do, and I hope to do it in my lifetime. Uh, next slide. <laughs> so I'm just going to share now globally, what do we know about use of pros in renal specifically? Um, we undertook a, something called a realist synthesis. So it is a theory-driven methodology for synthesizing evidence to understand why and how a complex intervention does or doesn't work. And it's premised on the assumption that um, complex social interventions are not universally successful. And it's the mechanisms through which they work to produce outcomes, and they're shaped by the context in which they're implemented. So as a starting point, my assumption is that pro-use is a complex social intervention. Uh, next slide. So the process then of doing a realist synthesis is to articulate ideas or what we call initial program theories about how uh, an intervention is intended to work. And then that's objective one here. And then objective two, test and refine these theories to a synthesis of the evidence. And on the next slide, you'll see our evidence. We searched and found 20,000 pieces of gray and peer literature on the use of pros and kidney. And after screening, which took oh, a good long time, we had 84 theoretical papers and 37 empirical. I'm just going to boil it down to a few slides what about what we found. Next slide. So pro-use in nephrology is theorized to be useful for improving person-centered nephrology care through three types of use. So the first is the individual level pro at point of care. This Next slide. The second, thank you, is use of aggregated pros at point of care, so again, between the person and the clinician. And the next is the use of aggregated pros by organizations. Um, of note, none of the sources included in this review explicitly articulated how theories or interventions would or did contribute to person-centered care. Rather, these sources referred to pro use and often postulated how they may contribute to person-centered care or some component of person-centered care, such as identifying patient priorities. Uh, next slide. So just to go into a little bit more articulated theories. So first, the strong majority of theoretical and empirical explorations are on this individual level of pro use and data where clinicians use them to support person-centered care. And then in turn, patient use can facilitate engagement in care. Um, an electronic um, collection may support efficiencies. A lot of literature on that. Um, the empirical literature supports the first three theories that are listed here, but those distal outcomes in the fourth have not been empirically proven. So the use is purported to uh, improve satisfaction, health, and quality of life. 
It's a very important point. Uh, we can come back to that later. Uh, next slide. Second, yeah, so with aggregation of pro data, so data can become publicly available like it is in the United King Kingdom, as I said earlier, um, for individuals to compare dialysis centers. So this can create this bottom up pressure from patients for providers to improve the quality of care. Of note, there was only one empirical article supporting this along with eight theoretical articles. And further, aggregated data can be used to compare individual kidney patient scores with aggregated scores for the purposes of comparison and to inform decision making. Um, while seven articles theorized such use, there was no research that we could find that actually showed that this was happening yet. Uh, and the next slide. So third, yeah, for our neighbors in the United States, so for single payer systems where patients have choice about dialysis centers, um, regular collection of pros at dialysis centers can be achieved through financial reimbursements and incentivization. So then this creates a top down pressure to improve care. And this theory was supported by empirical literature as well as 17 um, theoretical articles. Next slide. So when you put these all together, you see then these bottom up, which is the type two theories and top down pressures, type three, to collect pros, which can be used to trigger quality improvement processes. But perhaps more to the point, what does all this mean? So maybe the next slide, <laughs> take away from this global synthesis. So the current evidence has been primarily theoretical. The empirical work that's been done has focused primarily on the individual use of individual level pro data between the person and the clinician. Um, and despite national initiatives around the world to collect pro data, there really is a pressing need to address use of aggregated data because decision makers in health authorities and in government really need this evidence to inform future policy decisions. Um, and as I said earlier, I have always a bent towards the policy element of this. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, none of the sources included in our view explicitly articulated interventions uh, contributing to person-centered care. But we know through the extant literature that training of clinicians is a key marker of this. And so we put this project together to say, well, would it help if we trained clinicians? on use of pros. So we had this project called ePROKidney and CAHR funded the study. And I was a Crescent um, new investigator at the time. So I also always wanna give a shout out <laughs> to them and say, thank you. <laughs> and just to tell you, cause now we have the primary outcome analyzed. Um, so next slide. Our purpose was to assess whether educational support for multidisciplinary kidney clinicians using ePROs would enhance person-centered care. Next slide. We had 14 community advisory members who were trained in patient-oriented research and involved throughout the project, along with trainees, researchers, administrators. We were on site for two years, and it included a process evaluation and a mixed methods, longitudinal, comparative, uh, concurrent design. And the sites included urban home dialysis clinics, peritoneal dialysis, and home hemodialysis across all of Alberta. And at the implementation site, ePRO responses were provided to clinicians, and clinicians were offered educational th support through voluntary workshops. And then at the non-implementation site, ePRO responses were not provided to clinicians. And at both sites, there were 500 in together, 543 patients that provided ePROs throughout two years, and they had electronic access to their data throughout. Next slide. So the knowledge to action framework guided our work. And in year one, we began with multidisciplinary clinician and patient consultation at the implementation site to identify gaps and to de develop this clinician oriented education support with them. So from, and with patients, um, we learned about how did they observe their EPRO responses being used by clinicians? How would they like them to be used? How did they use them themselves in their self-care? And then from clinicians, we learned about, again, how they use them, how they could be used, what questions they had. And using this data, we began to create this educational support and we brought them early drafts uh, throughout. And 
um, particularly through focus groups. And the clinicians told us, which is on the right hand side, don't call them education, call them workshops <laughs> and host them in their building um, at a time that works for the clinic flow and bring in fun things, food, beverages, door prize, make them short and snappy. So we did all of those things. Um, next slide. During consultation, we identified knowledge needs, but also areas of strength to leverage. So these quotes show that clinicians wanted to know what patients thought about pro uh, responses, but they the, at the core was, well, how does this help me do my job? And patients didn't know what they were being asked to complete. They didn't know what would be done with their answers, if anything. And we learned that clinicians did not know how to invite a person to complete a very simple tool like this. So we created uh, this decision tree. Um, and so we gave prompts. <laughs> the clinician starts by saying, I would like to learn about your quality of life. Please answer these questions and then we'll discuss them together. And then prompts are provided throughout. Next slide. Great. So we had these uh, in year two, we rolled out these workshops and we provided them at 12 different times. And the workshop content grew from analysis of our qualitative data. And we drew on Bloom's taxonomy to address knowledge, skills and attitudes. And we consulted the extant literature, the health authorities, other pro teams, as I said, the global literature, um, as well as our community advisory throughout. And we created these workshops based on four themes. So the first is shown here, it's about um, e-pro use because it was electronic, integration in clinicians practice at point of care. Uh, next slide. The second one was, the workshop was presented by patient partners and they shared quotes from patients about their valuing of and their relationship to the use of e-pros in their care. Next slide. The third uh, workshop was on strategies for EPROS to support communication and coordination of, of patient care. And the next slide, this is the last one. So it emphasized the routine integration is actually a fundamental change to practice. And each of these workshops um, were at different times of the day. And we had 41 clinicians attend um, either one, two, three, or four. Um, over, over the 12 offerings. Next slide. So what did we find? So longitudinal structural equation models were used to compare change in overall PACIC scores, which is our um, primary outcome for person-centered care. And this image shows the scattering, <laughs> depicting substantial individual level variability in overall PACIC trajectories. So we found that the overall PACIC score, it was lower at the start of the study for the non-implementation site with greater improvement over time during that pre-workshop period. But what we care about is after the workshops and there was no detectable change over time in overall PACIC scores during the post-workshop periods in both sites. So why? <laughs> That's not what we wanted to see. There was no substantial difference in person-centered uh, care between the sites. So, well, because we had designed it as process evaluation, we analyzed the clinicians and patients' perspectives to perhaps unpack this finding. So next slide. We had three insights. So the first was that for eight years prior to our study at the implementation site, they had actually collected uh, the ESAS renal. They collected on, on laminated pieces of paper um, and they connected the, the KDQOL 36. Uh, both were entered manually into an electronic medical record. The clinicians did not see the KDQOL ever, but they sporadically had seen the ESAS renal. And then we brought in electronic capture and provided them to clinicians in real time. And during the initial focus groups, um, clinicians identified what additional health or quality of life information they might like patients to provide. And the clinicians chose to see what they were familiar with. Um, kidney symptoms were the priority. And quality of life was considered very vague. For patients, the information that they said was important was actually to be asked, how are you doing? And then they wanted somebody to acknowledge their response and they wanted their the EPRO responses that they provided to be addressed. Next, uh, next slide. So the workshops 
were tailored to insight too. The workshops were tailored to clinicians. They were not tailored to patients' educational needs. And if I had to redo, I'd be redo this one over. <laughs> While patients' perspectives and the extant literature certainly inform this design, and clinicians' knowledge, skills, and attitudes were targeted. What we recognize is that clinicians are one element of person-centered care, but they're not the whole. They're just one part. And they got all the focus in this study. So a focus on person-centered kidney care necessitates a culture shift from clinician or system orientation towards an emphasis on patients' values and priorities. And this is a fundamental change to practice. Um, it's a reorientation of delivery from a system orientation or dialysis oriented to patient or person centered. Um, so future um, patient oriented research from my perspective is to empower the person receiving dialysis to routinely use EPROs. And this approach has never been undertaken before. Next slide. So insight three. This is the last one. So despite our educational support, the use of EPROs was very variable. So in phase two, clinicians were asked um, every two weeks to anonymously answer this really simple two rating questionnaire. Um, they answered 244 times. And in summary, the EPRO data was viewed or used less than half of the time. So we were collecting it, but nobody was looking or very few were looking or using it. Next slide. So we see in this table, when we compare this before workshop, after workshop, we found this disparate uptake and change in knowledge and beliefs about use of pros. And after the workshops, the clinician narratives about how they used ePros was very much clinician dependent, and it really spanned the spectrum of person-centered kidney care. Patients still did not know who saw their responses, whose responsibility it was to bring it up in these for discussion, but they certainly saw the value in completing them and they appreciated seeing their own trends over the years and they envisioned use for their own self-care. Uh, next slide. So takeaways here. So, I mean, the strength of this approach was that it was longitudinal. There was a co-creation of the delivery of the workshops um, and drawing on the, the knowledge needs and strengths, both the clinicians and the patients had input and ownership in what we did in this project, but certainly it's left us with questions. So after two years of intensive on-site presence and engagement, clinician training on use of EPROs alone was insufficient to show improvement in person-centered care. And given the clinician's variable use of EPRO data, we created two animated whiteboards. Um, they're online, one for clinicians, one for patients, and these are made available after the, after the study. Um, as a form of knowledge translation, because we recognize the gaps more in the field. And, you know, there's this global movement right now towards person-centered kidney care. And while EPRO use has the potential to improve patient outcomes, additional strategies are certainly needed to impact person-centered kidney care. So I just want to end by talking about what might some of those strategies be. So next slide. I'm drawing here on the international resources of pro use because there is a whole disciplinary um, international body where this is their, their focus. Uh, they often culminate in the International Society of Quality of Life, which is a rich resource for us. And they have a user guide. And I just want to draw on some of their questions to guide strategies. So what are your goals? either at individual or aggregate use. Like, why are you doing this? <laughs> is it required? Is there something more? And, and is the data valued? And for me, the valuing has become more important. And then the second is who, where, when. So integration with clinic flow cannot be underestimated. We certainly learned that. <clears throat> and then how will they be collected? Next slide. The, these are some of the pragmatic things. Which measures inform clinicians and, and what would patients like to provide? Uh, the fourth one is what's the best mode? So paper, electronic, phone, culmination. What about your electronic health record? Is this linking with these major systems? Uh, next slide. Can the results be reported over time to show trends? We found that the trends were incredibly helpful. And are the results or educational materials provided to patients as well? Uh, the sixth one is, 
who is looking at the responses and who will respond? Uh, next slide. Have you considered any training? <laughs> As we talked about these years of training that we did, but also patience on what they're completing and interpretation. And here's a reference, a lovely article on training of clinicians that was incredibly helpful for our work. And number eight and last, build evaluation in right from the beginning of all of these types of initiatives. It will pay out in dividends in the end. Um, and next slide, which is my, I think second slide, penultimate slide. So momentum has been growing for use of proms in kidney care, both at individual and aggregate levels. Um, internationally in chronic illnesses and certainly in, in dialysis and in kidney care. The integration, however, is a complex social intervention. Uh, the use of PROMS to harness patient voices to improve care, this is by Ethan Bash, um, only happens if we value those voices and listen and respond. And integration of PRO requires a culture shift away from a system-oriented or a clinician-oriented approach to person oriented. Um, so with my next slide, there's my email and I just welcome your comments and questions now and just discussion and I'm going to stop. You can stop screen share and we'll just maybe see each other's faces. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful uh, discussion. Oh, we already have questions. Dr. Knowles. Thank you. That was really a great talk and um, obviously very complex research compared to some of the other, you know, research we do in clinical medicine. So thank you for heading down this way. Uh, question, like if you look at, has there been any evidence looking at um, whether if you're asking about outcomes and quality of life and there's, I suspect the best thing might be improvement in communication between, you know, the physician and the patient and then that leads to improvement in ex like experience scores. So yes. is there any link between those two? Because at our hospital, at a large system level, there's government mandated experience scores. So these are done all the time and they're difficult to interpret. Like for yeah, us, it's based on our inpatient unit. And it's kind of hard to see like, what can we do to change that score? So is there any linking of the direct outcome measures to leading to improvement in the experience yes exactly it's an it's an excellent question and what you're talking about is this linkage between uh, proms and prems yeah and so internationally this linkage between these types of standardized measures is is actually so to be honest in the field when we look at it from the time that it began to now this is a very recent trend so i under, want us to understand that what we're talking about is oh i'm going to say only in the last five years it, particularly i think because of the health systems requirements for accreditation and reporting and and the use of these instruments for this purpose so historically yes there is data primarily from cancer care that talks about how um quality of life and for example these um, more proximal outcomes of improved communication can improve patient experience However, I, my caveat would be that I've seen more of that in research environments than in health systems performance. Um, at a, in the, the literature that we looked at globally uh, in dialysis, I cannot say that I saw evidence to support that assertion. It was theorized, absolutely. But from my perspective, there is not evidence to support it thus far. I'll even pull back maybe a little bit further to say that in the empathy trial, um, their primary outcome, uh, not there, because I was a part of it too here in Alberta, so I take ownership. The primary outcome was communication. And from every, all of the data that we ran, we did not find that the use of pros include improved communication. Um, now, it has been shown in other areas. Um, and even in, in our work um, in ePROS, that's what we thought would want be one of the most kind of low hanging fruits. But the connection to, to corroborate not only pro use of first quality of life, because we think, well, if we collect information about quality of life and intend to it, then quality of life will improve. And as I said earlier on, 
that basic assumption does not yet have the evidence base to support it. I'm not saying we throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> I'm saying it's theorized and it's been shown in other areas. But how we enact that in the systems and in the care that we provide is still a very new field for us to figure out. And do you think so? To your very no, no. short. <laughs> do you think do some like we're looking at this? I'm involved uh, provincially. Uh, some form of measurement in the kidney transplant population. Yeah. So do you think embarking on this, we should be measuring outcomes and experience together if we're going to be starting with it? Absolutely. Yeah. And definitely that that is the movement that you use both. So they are distinct. They are like conjoined twins. You can use them for different purposes. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely. But I, I also recognize that, you know, one of the when Kai Hai took upon themselves um, to do a working group about kidney and pros, one of the cautions that we had, and this was, boy, 10 years ago, was, well, what is the evidence base to support these initiatives? So do they're important because they allow the person with the lived experience to provide some Im information. Mm -hmm. But the evidence to support the outcomes based on that, I would say, is yet to be determined. So... We do so cautiously without promises that this will change everything. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Peter. Yeah, hi. Um, I, hi. I, I, um, you know, I've heard Mike Walsh talk about the ex, uh, experience in Ontario. Yes. That he's sort of led with Ontario Renal Network and a bunch of centers, not our own. Um, uh, about one of the feedbacks you got from clinicians was that a lot of times physicians particularly, but maybe others, felt ill-equipped to deal with the complaints reported yeah. by patients. And there's a little bit of, if I don't know what to do for their depression, I don't want to know, you know, the see no evil, hear no evil kind of thing. <laughs> I think that's true of many complaints. Uh, we'd like to focus on specific things we have a drug for. Uh, it, a whole lot of the problem is equipment with tools to be actually able to deal with some of those complaints. Yes. Was that your what you found as well, or did that come out of your study? Hundred percent. Yeah, from the time my the very beginning when I when I did my first study in my PhD, 100% of the time, including in specifically rolling into ePros, um, I I've, I think of it in a few different ways. I believe there is an ethical component. If you are not intending to look at the responses or address them, I personally do not believe we should be asking. And as a patient, if I go into a clinic. And somebody asked me to complete something. I want to know, well, what are you going to do with my answers? Because <laughs> don't waste my time. But I think all of us would kind of say the same thing. So ethically, ab I, I agree with that. Moral and at a, on a moral level, but also from, as I said, my, my position is um, from a person-centered care perspective. I am becoming more aware that we in the kidney world are incredibly siloed. And... We've been, as practitioners and researchers, we have been disciplined it, over systems decades to think about the body part in relation to parts, cardiology, mental health, neurology, kidney. We deal with these particular things, but crossing the interdisciplinary realm where the body has multiple parts is what I was talking about in relation to a culture shift. So when pa and patients have told us this for years in our work, I've been told many times, if it's not related to my kidneys, they don't want to hear about it. So then if the system does has that perspective, then what are we going to do with the integration of proms where you've just asked people to report on multifaceted domains of quality of life? So and and I, I really uh, appreciate you bringing up mental health because the current study that I'm leading um, is multi, it's, it came from EPRO kidney, and it is, is specifically related to, to mental health. Uh, and the reason why I was surprised about that is because my very first work actually as a nurse was in mental health. So 
when patients in our qualitative data initially were telling us that, and I, I actually didn't believe the data, that should have been my first clue. They said, you know, I, I'm reporting a 10 out of 10 on depression, I'm reporting a 10 out of 10 on anxiety, nobody is talking to me about this. I thought that can't be true. <laughs> then we interviewed clinicians and they said, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm actually not bringing it up. So the current work that I'm doing is we're creating a pathway. If you have mental health concerns that are identified for all kinds of reasons, what might for clinicians, what might be some next steps? How do you link? And then the next work that we're going to do is we're going to create um, a patient oriented pathway so that the patient they have some idea of what the clinician sees but how to access resources themselves we have resources that we're just finishing actually through uh, can solve ckd all and i'm happy to share these with you when they go online every single mental health resource to dialysis patients in every province and territory in canada will be publicly available and we're going to be doing a, a real synthesis and evaluation of providing cognitive behavioral therapy to people who are receiving dialysis and have depression symptoms because at that time it has at this time it has the highest level of evidence but has not been done uh, in Canada ever so it seems like very low hanging fruit but right if we're going to ask what are we going to do about it and what are the resources to support clinicians but also patients and empathy did get at that though like empathy they they did have the supports um But we haven't we haven't reached our goal yet. <laughs> I, yes, so I just I agree with everything that you've said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Jan has another question. Hi, Jan. Hi, sorry, I'm driving, so I'm I'm not going to put my my camera on. Um, so thank you for a really interesting uh, talk. My question is, I think a little bit theoretical um, yeah. uh, and I'm I was I've been trying to think of a way to phrase it without sounding really paternalistic and I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm pretty sure I'm not paternalistic but um, I, I I we you know we do the ESAS in our conservative care clinic we we try to address the answers and so on my concern overall is that we you know we did all that research for decades and millenn you know forever out taking into account the patient perspective. My concern sometimes is that the patient perspective, it's not fully informed about the medical perspective, that people yeah. will say, I want this, but it really don't have a sense of what this entails, like all the, the ramifications of it, shorter life, or, you know, we're not going to treat your blood pressure, then you get a stroke and you're, and you're um, disabled from the stroke. You want CPR, but you, know, you don't want care so yeah. I, I i just i guess theoretically i'm just interested in your opinion about that i love the question jen and absolutely i hear you so i will respond from a principled perspective which is from a person-centered care orientation it is ultimately about the person living with their illness who will die with this illness and when we come together in a from a person-centered care perspective you're 100% right. That person brings exp experience and expertise about their life, but do they have the medical expertise? No, they don't have expertise in all kinds of areas, just like you don't have the expertise about their life. So in person-centered care, the intention is we come together and have these discussions. So there is shared decision-making. So the, the best I would say that we can do is, as you said, Jen, when, there, when we recognize that there are knowledge gaps, to attend to them to the best that we can. And ultimately, the person will make the decision, hopefully in as formed a way as possible. But it's their life. It's their life. And if they choose to make decisions that we don't support, ultimately, we walk with them along that side to the degree supporting them that we can. But yeah, I mean, I think all of us have been there. Um, one of the things early on I learned actually in my, my master's work with people with disabilities, which was about communication, actually the concept of feeling understood, which is um, both philosophical and theoretical. In communication, even though we share information, what a person hears about the information that we're sharing to them is not necessarily what they receive. 
<laughs> it's so basic, isn't it? So I think that's an ongoing discussion. But I just I hear you, Jan, and I and I think it's not distinct to this field about quality of life. But yes, yes. I think Mark has a question uh, from the conference. Mark. Hi, Cara. I haven't seen you for a little while, but uh, it's Hi. good to know that the, the uh, that environmental scan looks yeah. like it's nearly complete now, which is amazing. It's a lot of work. Um, so there, I guess there's two 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 questions. One is, um, or maybe it's more of a an observation. I would say that in the when studies report on quality of life, yeah, especially if I think patients have been involved in defining those outcomes. Uh, yeah. One thing that tends to happen is that you've got this score built on multiple domains, yes. and maybe only one or two of those domains might actually be relevant to the intervention or the population. And yet we take the whole thing and we hit it with a big hammer and we say there was no difference in the mean quality of life across this massively complicated thing, and the p-value was point. Oh, 09, therefore the intervention did not improve quality of life. And you're like, well, that seems a little crude compared to all the effort that went into the study. So yeah. just your thoughts on that. And then the second issue, I think um, while it's really good to think about how these outcomes should be tailored to patients with kidney disease, like by the time someone ends up on dialysis, they actually bring a lot of experience with them of other chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart failure. Yeah. And each of those conditions also has its own literature in terms of yeah. for diabetes, things like self-efficacy, self-management. Yeah. So they come to dialysis with a whole array of different experiences. And some of them are, you know, have been managing their own disease for a long time. And for other people, this is their first experience of managing a disease by themselves. I'm just wondering if there are differences based on comorbidity burden by the time they actually reach dialysis. Yeah, great, great insights and great questions. So the last one that you just talked about, the comorbidity burden at 100%. And we, going to your earlier point, we cannot, about the crudeness of it, um, we cannot say that a patient is a patient, I and mean, you all know that. They come with such diverse life and comorbid experiences. Um, so we cannot treat them the same. The tailoring is essential. And part of the unique element contextually, though, in dialysis is that we have long, we have long term relationships with people. So that is one of the benefits, I guess, of what we do. It's not a one-time shot. You don't have a knee replaced and then you're done with that joint. <laughs> we have an organ that it requires ongoing maintenance. Um, so yes, that impact. We can draw on some of our colleagues in other fields who have significantly advanced in the field beyond this. Diabetes is a very good example. I've been looking at um, international guidelines, particularly, again, for mental health. You would not believe what diabetes has done, both, both in the evidence field, but in, in um, clinical practice guidelines for diabetes and mental health. How many of our people have diabetes? It's massive, right? So, and it applies. So yes, we can draw on those resources. And I think we're actually in catch up mode. We've been left behind in some of these fields. The first point that you had about well, p-values, don't even get me started on there. So, I mean, the, the, when we come to um, psychometrics of, the, these are measurements that require psychometric analysis. And we know statistically, when you talk to biostatisticians and in the field in the last, boy, three to five years, the comments when people say, this is the p-value, therefore it is or is not statistically significant, that ship has sailed years ago. That is no longer the benchmark that we are using. And if people are clumping together um, a domains and saying there's one um, score, then my response is usually the analysis has been, not been done correctly. So we must look at smaller, we must look at the domains, we must ensure that our instruments are being analyzed in a, in a correct way. 
um, and re and report on them. It doesn't necessarily mean that the results are wrong, but it means that our analysis must be very informed. And I personally don't hold all of that um, expertise. That's why we have teams bring together brilliant people that are more brilliant than ourselves. Thank goodness to do this work. We need them all. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes and I might uh, squeeze in three questions. Uh, so the, you know, going on the pre value stuff. Yeah. I think these these prompts they seem like a complex instrument. It's not like measuring a blood pressure or measuring a, a phosphate level or what have you. Uh, especially when you look at that scale of that plot of oh, yeah. that yeah. you showed, it looks like a very noisy data set. It uh, is a noisy data set. It's it going to be hard to show a p value difference. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I like the insights that you showed, right? Despite the fact that it was not significant, you learned something. Uh, that you could share. Is that where the field is moving? I mean, I vaguely remember that it's very hard to show a difference in quality of life, but that's not the purpose. The p-value is not the purpose of doing the study. Is that uh, sort of how the field is thinking about this? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. That scatter plot that just shows the disparateness. Um, you know, I've been a I've been leading a, a few projects at the same time. They're showing the exact same results. So we did a study very similar across multiple provinces in home care, both with people receiving home care and health, um, sorry, family caregivers, which I love because I just think they are an untapped resource in, in our healthcare system. Same result, results. So yeah, we're seeing that over and over in these longitudinal studies of this really disparate field. The, the task for us is to figure out, and what do we do with this? <laughs> So yes, 100% to that. Um, but again, uh, coming back to why are we doing this? It is not about a p-value. It is about figuring out how do we improve the lives and the quality of life of the person that's living with this condition and how do we partner with them? So we have to keep asking these really challenging questions and improve the care, both at individual levels and at policy levels, because um, so we got to ask these hard questions of ourselves, even if we don't know the full answer yet. But the truth is in the question, not in the answer, isn't it? <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, well said. Thank you again for uh, coming up so early in the morning to present uh, for us. Uh, it's an honor. Thank you for inviting me. And also, Kevin, thank you. I honor you in this work. Take care. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>